This is Paul Walsh with the Weather Channel. Hey, everybody. Let's sit over here. I actually haven't been on this side of the stage okay. yet. Well, we're going to continue on the theme of big data yep. and data in general. I think it's actually something that a lot of businesses actually have access to today. Uh -huh. uh, I think social, I think everybody in the room is in agreement that social uh, gives you access to more information. I think yep. the problem is, is what people do with that information. Right. So let me just set it up real quick because okay. I've, I just came from a, a very large uh, insurance company who has a built-in research department. Their whole job is to get this data and to pre <laughs> prepare these three ring binders uh, and give it to all of their respective departments so that they can understand what's happening in terms of trends and performance. Right. And those binders were the only things in their offices that had dust on them. <laughs> I don't know that they've even been opened. Right. There's this pervasive sense of you know, information paralysis right. that if there's no time to look at this, no real sense of urgency or importance, but this is something that you've embraced at the Weather Channel. Right. Um, why don't we start with sort of your role within the Weather Channel and how do you approach big data? Okay. Um, I am a vice president of weather analytics. Um, I'm actually a meteorologist, so if it rains today, it's not my fault. <laughs> and I actually forgot my umbrella, which I'm sort of kicking myself for. Um, and my background as a meteorologist was actually in the military. Um, and in the military, weather informa information is very specifically used as intelligence. And so weather information and forecasts are built into uh, war plans, basically, and it's used to help form strategies. And so my background when I left the military was basically to do the same thing, only working with large retailers and manufacturers and CPG companies to help sort of understand how to, or first of all, how the weather is influencing consumer behavior, and then use those insights to better plan product launches, um, how much product to buy, and, and how to distribute them. Um, at the Weather Channel, we're actually doing very, very similar things, only from a media perspective. Now, we know that the weather has a huge influence on, on us, on all of us. All of us today, at some point or, or other, check the weather. And we did that, some of it sort of sub subconsciously, but, but mainly we look at the weather in a very utilitarian way to determine what we're going to wear, what are we going to eat, what are we going to do for the weekend. Or whether or not we need an umbrella. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although some of us are too busy and we you know, forget. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that sort of that insight can be very, very useful from both a media and an advertising perspective and being able to understand at a local level how the weather is influencing behavior, how importantly the weather forecast is influencing consumer behavior, um, and use that information to both create content, sort of hyper-local content, planning information, which becomes very useful for people and sort of transcends just a weather forecast and becomes uh, information that they can use to better plan their, their day and activity. From an, ad, from, a media, from an advertising perspective, obviously if you know that your forecast for a given market is gonna drive a need or a want for a particular product category or an activity, you can then align your advertising to align with, with that um, with that demand that you're causing. Right. Um, and so we're looking at weather as really an enabler, both for us from a media content perspective, as well as um, for our advertisers, to be more specific, more local, um, as it relates to their ability to communicate with their customers. And so data, the fact that we reach probably half of the US population every month, we have this tremendous amount of data from which to start to mine, mm -hmm. to understand what happens when Jim Cantore, who's our star, shows up at, the, at Jacksonville, Florida? Uh, and what happens in Atlanta when there's a prediction of an inch of snow versus that same exact day when there's a prediction of an inch of snow in Buffalo? Because in Atlanta, it's Armageddon, and in Buffalo, it's a golf day. And all of that is knowable. And of course, from a Weather Channel perspective, because we're doing predictions, and we know that our predictions is actually driving consumer demand, we can then leverage our predictions to be able to serve ads and content that is, that is relevant and useful to our audience. And I think at a, at a very high level, as the weather continues to get more sort of weird and, and volatile, using data in this way to help create content that becomes useful to consumers as well as advertisers is another way to sort of, sort of adapt to the way the weather's changing. So it, it, it enables us to leverage data and leverage our channel to provide something that at the end of the day is actually more useful than than just simply throwing data out of people. Well, part of that's data, and part of that's behavioral as well, I mean, which sort of triggers its own data. Right. But there's also the culture of 
doing something with that data inside the Weather Channel. And I, you've, you've laid out quite a sophisticated model within the organization that doesn't just affect content, it affects how you're able to align hyper-local content to help people make better decisions right. of what they're gonna do based on how they get that data. And then more importantly, how you can sell against it or how you could monetize that. Right. So I guess there's an ROI that, <laughs> that a Absolutely. lot of people don't necessarily realize in their day-to-day -day work. But, the behavior side is also fascinating to me because yeah. I actually am a big, uh, big believer in, in social science. I think the idea of ethnography, I believe sociology, anthropology right now for all businesses uh -huh. is actually a very big deal because these trends are not only transformative, these trends are very disparate in terms of how behavior is, 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 is grouped today because right. there are some people who won't turn on a television. I had a, a real great conversation with somebody the other day who said, you know, I was, uh, have you ever watched this television show? And the, the person on the other side said, you know, kind of smugly, well, I don't even have a TV. I don't, I don't watch TV. And she says, neither do I, but I have an iPad and I have an <laughs> iPhone. Well, you still don't watch television? Right. And it was like, exactly. So you had right. two different mindsets, yet their behavior is absolutely different. And so you have to sort of design experiences around each types of those scenarios. So right. how does that factor into the organization? Well, you know, I'm, a big, a big growth area, obviously, within the Weather Channel is our mobile technologies, and that's where uh, increasingly, I don't know if it's crossed, crossed over yet, but a large part of our audience gets their information from the, from the mobile phone. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're focusing on that as a platform to be able to send information out. If you think about it, uh, the, the inherent, obviously, localness of a local phone and being able to sort of get a sense for where people are when they're checking the weather, um, that gives us another level of granularity in terms of being able to serve up a message that will tell me that, hey, in an hour you're gonna need an umbrella, mm -hmm. and by the way, you can buy one and down the block and to the right, and by the way, I'll give you a coupon if you come buy my umbrella from me. Right. So that's sort of the, 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 sort of the, the rollout of this and the ability to sort of leverage um, those predictable sort of insights. And, and I think the key thing from a weather perspective, now I'm, I'm a weather guy, of course, but in terms of being able to predict the weather is, is a lot more scientific and a lot more accurate than an economic forecast or a trend forecast. We get a lot of sort of a lot of bad uh, bad press around the weather forecast always being wrong, but it isn't always wrong. It's most of the time is right. And so, if you understand how that weather forecast is going to shape behavior, whether it's on the local block or a given market, you can be very precise in terms of how you communicate to people on the other side. Well, I guess on the bright side of that, if the Mayan calendar is correct, we won't have to predict future of the, or weather in January 2013. So we only have a little bit of time. For uh, that. I don't think they're very good. <laughs> We're way more accurate than those guys are. So don't worry about the Mayan calendar. All right. So uh, you said something very interesting because we're talking a lot about social, right? But I yep. think really what I want everybody to hear out of this conversation is the idea of just behavior. And there's certainly a digital culture. There's a digital Absolutely. lifestyle where social plays a part of that. But it's the screen. I believe that the screen is sort of the window to a different world. And so that screen could be a laptop. That screen could be a television. It could be a, a, an iPhone or uh -huh. a droid. It could be a tablet. Uh, how are you sort of interpreting that data separately? Or are you interpreting that separately? And what does that report out look like? We, you know, we are. And it's very interesting because when you start to look at the social graph, especially looking at Twitter data, mm -hmm. which we're, we're looking at, you find very interesting correlations between specific conversation and specific words that are sort of tied back to the weather. And it sort of speaks to how the weather is making people feel. So today is a perfect day to, to go to the beach. Today is a perfect day to go jogging. Um, uh, one thing I always like to point out, being a, being a, a relatively, I'm like a, I'll say an old weather guy, I gotta <laughs> couch that, is that I was very interested to find that uh, on, the, uh, on the Twitter sphere, um, the word weather is more popular than, than sex. So we're better than sex from a weather perspective. I thought that I'd ever be able to you say You guys could hashtag that too. <laughs> <laughs> weather is better than sex. Uh, but if you think about it, everybody, that's the first conversation everybody has. And okay. they, they always comment on that. But then beyond that, there is just sort of the correlative sort of messages and conversations that happen where people aren't necessarily thinking about the weather, but the weather's driving a sort of a mood or behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and we're monitoring that and modeling that basically off both off the social graph and we're doing our own um, surveying on weather.com and, and capturing that same sort of thing. So asking people, how does the weather make you feel today? Great, lousy, you know, uh, awesome. Um, and it's, it's very interesting how the same weather can drive different behaviors in different cities. A rainy day in Seattle versus a rainy day in LA is gonna have a different behavior on how people in LA react. Same sort of Atlanta, right. Buffalo example. Well. Yeah. In case you haven't picked up on it, almost every single one of these discussions has used the word emotion. 
Right. Uh, and emotion is something that I find, well, emotional and it's very also inspiring or, or aspirational in the sense that once you can see how people feel, uh -huh. it's supposed to touch you. It's supposed to trigger empathy. That idea of empathy is supposed to then trigger ideas around the content you can create or around the products that you can create to sort of evoke those types of emotions right. or shift those emotions in a much more productive standpoint. Mm -hmm. But that, just that word it does, is not a popular word inside of most organizations. Emotion. Emotion. So you get it. Uh -huh. But how does everybody in this room figure out how to apply emotion or the idea of emotion and behavior to what it is that they do? It's, it's interesting you say that because we, we've been modeling or we've been doing our own sort of internal surveys off of weather.com for about mm, almost a year now. And one of the questions that we use goes back to that sort of emotional question. How does the weather feel to you? Mm -hmm. And when we first started doing it, I thought it was a little bit of a lark. I, I, I didn't think it was all that you know, interesting. Um, but as I talk to uh, marketers and CMOs, I get a lot of very, they, they, they are very, very interested in, in understanding and getting access to that information so they can, you know, ultimately, you know, we can predict happiness. If we know, you know, historically from the data and the modeling that this, this kind of weather in this market generates this kind of mood, then it gives them another, a whole other sort of very interesting data point in terms of being able to think about how you want to message to people in a couple of days. Right. That's the other thing about this is that everything we're talking about is, is very predictable. Again, more so than economics, more so than the stock price. It's all based on science. So we know what the weather's going to be like-ish, you know, 95%. Um, and if you know historically what that means for uh, the mood of people and the sentiment of people in New York, you can then change your change both your ad message and also your content right. so that it becomes in alignment with that and becomes, I'll say it again, becomes useful. It sort of transcends just simply being a media channel and you start to become uh, helpful to people. Right. And right. even making the ad messages helpful to people. Like if I got one saying you need an umbrella an hour and an hour from now you can get it you know, around the block, that would be really, really helpful. And I wouldn't have to spend 50 bucks for one drop of guy off the street. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of finding, you, you said that people sort of take this utilitarian role with weather, but the idea that you're able to translate that behavior and those analytics into something that's helpful is, right. is something that I think every single one of us could benefit from. Mm -hmm. So what you're really starting to talk about now is the idea of moving from analytics to predictive analytics and so that you can exactly. actually create the types of experiences and helpful types of outcomes that you think people will want. Right. And so obviously that's working out because you're able to monetize that. But yep. let me introduce a quick scenario with the two minutes we have left. And that okay. is that you, research and analytics isn't necessarily something new to the organization. I think what has to be new or what needs to evolve is sort of the, what I call the human algorithm. It's this idea that somebody's got to be on the other side of the data and sort of championing that throughout the organization. Right. You know, so we had the Huffington Post here a few minutes ago sharing how they have a whole department of these people pushing it through and it's changed the culture of their company into one right. that's more performance based. Mm -hmm. uh, I see companies that are getting close to analytics in terms of social data analysis of sentiment or right. conversational analysis and share a voice or, or word of mouth. But it's more than that. So how, how do you employ the algorithm? What advice do you have for people here to put that human algorithm into play? So I think it really comes down to uh, embracing the leveraging and the, and the application of data um, into your sort of your strategic, strategic outlook. So it becomes a sort of a framework for what you're doing. And then, and then build up an organization that is, that is both academically savvy but also um, operationally efficient because right. you can you can very very quickly sort of become swallowed up in all this data you know the good news is there's tons and tons of data because imagine we have 150 million unique visitors per month so we have tons and tons of data we're pulling in data off the social graph um, you need to have the right people that know how to correctly interpret it and they need to can be completely plugged into the, the sort of the, the business end of the business um, otherwise You'll never get anything done, and you'll and you'll die. So you start small, you test and learn, just like you know the, the last group was saying, and then you build off of those learnings and, and and then scale up to get to that to that final vision. But it's just a it's just a tremendous opportunity, the uh, the ability to uh, leverage data and technology to, um, in, from a media perspective anyway, to be much much more relevant. Yeah, yeah, using the data to make the case, and also using data to 
inspire innovation. So Paul, thank you so much for being on here. Great, thank you, Brian. Well, let's go.